December 22nd, 1987, the Franklin Plaza Hotel, Los Angeles, California. Inside, rock legend Nikki Six, bassist and songwriter for Motley Crue, is about to go over the edge. So he says to the dealer, fix me. Nikki's a sick guy that is doing these things because he can't help himself. Within seconds, his night of rock and roll, drinking and drugs comes to a crashing stop. He overdoses, his heart stops beating. When you hit the invisible line, there's no coming back. Nikki had hit that line and was about to cross over it. I don't think this guy's gonna make it. Nikki Six was about to die. Hollywood, California. It's after midnight, but Nikki Six, bassist and songwriter for rock band Motley Crue, has already spent hours in the strip clubs and bars that line the Sunset Strip. It's standard practice for a guy as famous for his partying as for his music. An hour later, Nikki and his friend Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash and some others head to the Franklin Hotel. Nikki's no stranger to the hotel or the drugs there. Everything from pills to coke. But tonight, it's heroin. And this time will be different. Tonight, heroin would kill him. My heart had stopped in the hotel room. Paramedics were called. They put me on the gurney. And as the EMTs roll him out, Nikki Six is pronounced dead at the scene. I was covered with the sheet. I was done. It was a predictable end to a year spent spiraling out of control. A year intimately detailed in Nikki Six's heroin diaries. Nikki Six was born Frank Ferrana in 1958 in San Jose, California. His mother was a 19-year-old former backup singer for Frank Sinatra. His father worked construction when he worked at all. His father left home at a very early age. Nikki was two or three. And his mother um, worked at various jobs. They really lived all over. Often kids who move place to place don't feel like they have anything permanent in their life. And it can often make the child feel very angry and frustrated. And that can often lead to very difficult times later on. His mother would basically ship him off to Idaho. And he was raised primarily by his grandparents. He had a real affection and love and affinity for his grandmother in particular. They thought that he was this really special kid who had this gift that no one could quite put their finger on. Kids need one person in their life to make themselves feel worthwhile, and if they don't have a parental figure, often a grandparent will do. But even his grandmother could never substitute for a real father figure. With no one to guide him, Nikki stayed focused on the one thing that made him special. Music. Music became Nikki's way to express himself, his anger and rebellion. He was a huge Kiss fan, a huge Alice Cooper fan. And he, from early on, that was his passion. He lived for their music, even dressing like them. Kids who have a lot of rage, you see these guys sort of acting out a lot of aggression and frustration, and they see them doing it in a very socially acceptable way through their music. And at the same time, people love them. And who wouldn't want that, especially a kid who's really in need of attention? But Nikki didn't want to just be a rock fan. He wanted to be a rock star. With no money in his pockets, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He walked into a pawn shop, made like he was filling out an application to work there, and when the guy turned around, he picked a guitar off the wall, put it in a guitar case, and just walked out. The rebellious teen then took the bus to his grandparents' home, his guitar across his lap. Showed up with, I think I had like silver hair and these huge platform boots. But Nikki's mind was filled with dreams of rock and roll and the life that went with it. It was insane. I was like frothing at the mouth to get into this business and do it, and nothing was going to stop me. So I worked until I saved enough money to take the Greyhound bus to Los Angeles. For Nikki, LA wasn't just a city, it was the promised land. The year was 1979, and Hollywood and the Sunset Strip were a seedy rock and roll paradise.
These bands lived in a very low-life way. They were sleeping on the couches of every whore on the Sunset Strip and getting the requisite diseases. And it's like there were greater errors in music, but never were there more crabs in rock and roll. Nicky fell into the scene like he was born to it. He slept in derelict houses and abandoned cars, living on the streets and working crap jobs to get by. It didn't matter because at night there was rock and roll. I started playing in bands, auditioning for bands. I was in a band called London. We were right in the middle of the punk rock movement. We were very pop, glam. London quickly built up a strong following in the seedy clubs off the Sunset Strip. It was his first real taste of the dream, but it wasn't enough. London wasn't Nikki's music or Nikki's vision. That all changed in 1980 when Nikki formed his own group, and this one would be perfect. Nicky began by recruiting three musicians to fit his vision of an aggressive punk band. Singer Vince Neil. It was always about Vince having a unique voice and giving him a sound. Guitarist Mick Mars. To me, it was always about Mick Mars taking those pop ideas and making them brutal. And drummer Tommy Lee. It was always about Tommy being a really solid rhythm machine, and that was a band. He had a vision, he had an agenda, he had a vibe. There was something he wanted to get across, an anger, an aggression. Bands are a lot like gangs, and people belong to gangs because they don't have a family. If you're in a band, there's a lot of camaraderie, there's a lot of fun, you've got a structure and you've got a purpose together. With his ideal band assembled, Nikki's lifelong vision of rock and roll fame was on the edge of coming true. There's something about the four of us that creates some weird energy. I don't know what it is. With their wild look and aggressive sound, Nikki's band, the newly formed Motley Crue, started to rock their way into the clubs on the Sunset Strip. in the unhinged 80s club scene, Nicky would find women, fame, and money. But he would also find that even achieving your wildest dreams might not be enough. I had a dream to become a rock star. Sometimes they say, be careful what you wish for. And I got it. I woke up a drug addict. L.A.'s Sunset Strip was the center of the rock universe. It was free frolicking. It was fun. It was good. You know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Bass player and songwriter Nikki Six had put together his glam rock dream team called Motley Crue. When Motley Crue came around, that was like, you know, the match to the gunpowder of the Sunset Strip scene in the 80s. Like Nikki, the band was part punk, part glam, part metal, part rock, and all attitude. There was punk rock over here. There was us. We kind of didn't fit, but we did fit. And you'd look at the audience, and it was half punk rockers, half glamours. It was fresh for these kids. Nikki pushed the limits in his look, in his music, and in his life. The Sunset Strip offered every temptation you could imagine. Nikki wanted them all. We were doing drugs right from the beginning. Are you kidding? Aisles of cocaine, baggies of pills, more alcohol than you could drink or should drink, and we drank it all anyway. Nikki's band was as sexy and dangerous as its founder, especially when 6'4 Nikki set himself on fire as part of the act. He would take Molotov cocktails and throw them at the ceiling and light himself on fire literally at every set. And that scared me to death. All that hairspray and everything, I thought he could go up in flames at any moment. And that's what he loved most, the danger. It gets me off. And then I'm excited. Nikki's vision was proving dead on. 
By 1982, the band's sex, swagger, and intense live shows sent Motley Crue's popularity through the roof. Motley Crue, that was a new thing. People were buying the record regardless of, of, of radio play. It was a word of mouth thing, and it was something new. They were the baddest of the bands. Doug Thaler caught their show in Santa Monica. They'd sold the place completely out, 4,000 people. They had sold every piece of merchandise they had. And what I saw on the stage that night was absolutely a hit act, right from the get-go. Electra Records took a chance and signed them. Motley Crue was the first glam metal band picked up by a mainstream label. These guys walk in with these, you know, platform boots and the hair up to here, and they jingle jangle everywhere, and you could hear them, you could feel them, you could really sense their presence. And the fact that just walking in the building, they could terrorize people, I loved that. That got my attention. I thought, ooh, this could be good. In August 1982, Nikki's writing on the song Livewire propelled the band's first album, Too Fast for Love, into cult status. When the crew came aboard with that album, man, it just it rocked. I'm run free, a little bit better than it used to be. I mean, this thing just blasted off. Those songs are all rooted around his actual biographical experience as a homeless kid on the streets of Hollywood, completely having music as the only thing to live for. Music is a way to express yourself. It's a way to express anger, aggression, rebellion, those feelings that he probably couldn't express when he was a kid because they were too scary. With the crew, Nicky had found his family, an outlet for his gift, and guys who would go with him to the limits, no matter how far. He has always known exactly where he was going. He had all the records all planned out. He had the titles. He practically had the album art all together in his mind. He had a complete and detailed vision. It was really his concept, his look. He came up with what the music was going to be. For Nicky, Motley Crue was about more than just the music. It was a 24-7 lifestyle. Alcohol and drugs were also constant, especially for Nikki and Tommy Lee. Nervous theater managers began to call them the toxic twins. People who are rebellious, they often hook up together. When two people who are destructive get together, they can often become very explosive. For one of us to dive in the audience and get in a fist fight was no big deal. So it just became what we did. In June of 1983, Nikki's fun and games took a dark and almost deadly turn. Nikki was partying in a mansion in the Hollywood Hills. After doing lines of coke off the top of a friend's grand piano, Nikki decided to drive home. He couldn't find his clothes, so he took off naked in his Porsche. Nikki drove the Porsche down Coldwater Canyon to to toward home and lost it. Nikki raced the Porsche through the tight curves of Coldwater Canyon. Once again, he was pushing it to the limit, only this time, he went too far. And absolutely demolished the, the Porsche. He wound up in the hospital for a couple of days with a dislocated shoulder. With the band burning valuable studio time for their next record, Nikki wouldn't take the time to let his shoulder heal. So he went looking for a quick fix. He found it. But the cure would soon prove worse than the disease, especially when the cure was heroin. Motley Crue was one of the hottest bands on the Sunset Strip. It was the culmination of a lifelong dream for a once lonely and abandoned kid. But in June, Nicky had crashed his Porsche, badly injuring his shoulder. 
right in the middle of recording his band's breakthrough record, Shout at the Devil. To cope with the pain, Nicky started experimenting with a new drug, one he'd never tried before, heroin. It worked. He, he actually went back and finished his bass parts. Yeah, I, I don't think he missed any studio days. At first, it seemed like it was worth it. In September, Shout at the Devil hit the stores and sold 200,000 copies in its first two weeks. Molly Crew exploded with that record. The first day I got it, I probably played the entire album maybe 30 times, from literally waking up to the time I went to bed at night, all the way through, because I found my rock gods. The album went gold by Christmas. Nikki's adolescent dreams were coming true. He was now a bona fide rock star. Right about that, that same time, uh, I was able to secure a special guest spot for him on the Ozzy Osbourne tour. It was a huge break for the band, but under Ozzy Osbourne's influence, Nikki's debauchery ramped even higher. They would have drug dealers following them around, cocaine dealers that would follow their buses around. And of course, the girls. There were girls everywhere, backstage, in hotels, on the bus, willing to do whatever he wanted. I gotta tell you, it was fantastic. I don't apologize for one destroyed hotel, any broken hearts, destroyed cars. We ingested, injected, and destroyed everything in our path. And it was just amazing that we survived it. Ozzy and Nikki even competed to see who could be the most twisted. I'm not sure what Nikki's deed was, but Ozzy's rejoinder was to get down on the pool tarmac and snort some live ants. So, like, Nikki got up, proceeded to urinate on the tarmac, and Ozzy proceeded to snort that, and that was case closed. The, the gross out contest was over. You know, a lot of it's spurred by boredom, to be honest with you. You're in your very early 20s and you're thinking, makes sense to throw wine bottles at passers-by from the 12th floor. Makes sense to me. You know, now I look and I go, okay, so I actually could have killed somebody. But for us, at that time, it just made sense. Their success allowed them to get away with it and even rewarded them. And it was only like in the fall of 1984 that people had some money to play with. After the big European dates, there was nearly $100,000 profit to be split. For Vince Neil, it meant getting a car. For Tommy, it meant getting married and getting an apartment. For Nikki, it meant getting more drugs. But it was never enough for Nikki. Despite his success, he went right back to work on his next record. And once again, he hid his pain in plain sight. The record, called Theater of Pain, was released in 1985. And this one went to the top with a bullet. The song Smoking in the Boys Room became the crew's first top 20 hit. It was a mainstream big pop hit right there next to Michael Jackson and Pat Benatar. But behind the onstage glory, Nikki's sickness and depression was turning into a drug-addled nightmare. It really started in theater of pain, where it started to become an addiction. So there's that period, you know, 85 leading into 86, where it wasn't fun anymore. And that kind of sucks to be in a rock band and not be having any fun. Nikki's habit had taken him over. His childhood was haunting him, and on smack, he felt normal. And when he was off smack, he, he was in this, this agonizing pain. It's the extreme pleasure and the sedation. And then because of the, because of the great feeling, people go back and they want more. It's a one-way street. You can't back down it. You can't turn around. You're heading to the invisible line. When you hit the invisible line, there's no coming back. And few realized just how close to that invisible line Nikki was getting came out when I had them rehearsing at a studio up in Massachusetts. Rehearsals were going a little, you know, like, not right. 
And Mick Mars became incensed and said, this isn't working because Nikki had got some heroin. And I was like, oh my God. You know, like, uh, you know, like uh, I was aghast. Remarkably, Nikki could still write great songs and perform. So most people looked the other way. Nobody was trying to stop this. It was like a bullet train that everybody was jumping on, and how much faster can we make it go? Few realized just how sick Nikki had become. He was spending $5,000 a day on drugs. Their tolerance for drugs was so high that at one point, they were actually injecting hard liquor, not drinking it. They were shooting it in their arms. In 1986, the Theater of Pain tour headed to Europe. On Valentine's Day, Motley Crue was booked to play a show in London's Hammersmith Odeon. On stage, Nicky felt like he was losing his battle with the demon. That first show, all I could think about was getting off stage and scoring drugs. I mean, the whole show, I was going through withdrawal. It's all I could think about. Desperate for a fix, Nicky found a grungy shooting gallery and a dealer who appeared to have clean needles. I let somebody shoot me up. And I did overdose. Nikki stopped breathing. The dealer beat him with a baseball bat to try to wake him up. It didn't work. They figured he was going to die. Panicked, the dealer dragged Nikki's comatose body out of the room. The dealer had to get rid of this body. So they were taking me to the trash van. They all got scared. Took him out and threw him in a dumpster. That was what Nikki's rock dreams had made of him. A junkie left for dead in the trash. <laughs> Valentine's Day, 1986. As Motley Crue, one of the world's biggest bands, was getting ready to play London's Hammersmith Odeon, their founder and bass guitarist, Nikki Six, was nowhere to be found. Where you gonna be tomorrow? How you gonna face the sorrow? He was across town, lying in a trash dumpster, tossed in by a dealer who had given him up for dead after a heroin overdose. Remarkably, Nikki came too. Dragged in later that day, and said that he had the flu or something, and nobody believed him. Even Nicky couldn't believe it. Even by his standards, he'd hit a new low. There's a difference in experimenting and partying and having fun in Animal House and debauchery and then just straight up addiction. And as he was finding out, heroin was different. Alcohol, acid, cocaine, they were just affairs, he said. When I met heroin, it was true love. Nikki was hooked. He was shooting up several times a day. Heroin, scoring it and shooting it, became all he could think about. It's all about just trying to get through the day at that point. Nikki wasn't a rock star, he was a junkie. Back at home, Nikki was becoming increasingly paranoid. Most days were spent alone, holed up in the Van Nuys mansion he called Heroin Hill. His only friend was a diary he kept to record his thoughts. I was asking those questions. You know, was this because of, you know, my childhood? Is this because of being in a band? He wrote, before the band, I only lived for music. After it started, I only lived for drugs. I've lost my passion for music. All I think about is drugs. I don't think about music anymore. The combination of coke and heroin made him hallucinate. When things got really weird, he hid in the closet, surrounding himself with his diary, his drugs, and a gun. It was very difficult to keep him on the phone for more than a minute or two. He'd say, wait a minute, there's Mexicans with guns, and they're climbing over the wall. I, I got to go. And just when he felt he had hit the bottom, the bottom fell out. On July 15, 1986, Nikki's beloved grandmother, Nona, passed away. He feels like he's got no family but the drugs. 
Her death was a shocking blow, one that pushed Nikki that much closer to the edge. In fact, Heroin had so much control over Nikki, he couldn't even pay his final respects. He can't even go to the funeral because he's so strung out and so screwed up by that point. Personally, he doesn't want to deal with any of it. But he still managed to deal with being a rock star. In 1987, the band released Girls, Girls, Girls. It was the biggest Motley Crue hit so far, and it took Nicky and his problems around the world. December 22nd, 1987. The band had just wrapped the brutal Far East leg of their tour and Nikki boarded a flight to Los Angeles. Before Nikki's plane had even touched down, he'd arranged to score some heroin. I had called my dealer and had a limo pick him up, and he met me at the airport. I shot up, I dropped him off, I went home. A quick shower, and he headed out to meet some friends. Went and picked up Slash, we got high, then we went out. I think we were at the Cat House in Hollywood. And we went back to the Franklin Plaza Suites. Nicky would come a long way since he first hit Hollywood. No more squats or junk cars to sleep in. Now he partied at expensive hotels with the most famous people in music. Slash was living there at the time, his girlfriend, and a few bands were all staying there. And we found this dealer. After a long night of cocaine, alcohol, and pills, Nikki was too wasted to shoot up, but not too wasted to want more heroin. Slash, at this point, is passed out on a couch drunk. Nikki Six says to the heroin dealer, fix me, shoot me up. The dealer shot him up. The drug coursed into Nikki's veins, but his system, already flooded with liquor, pills, and heroin from his meeting at the airport, shut down. Too much heroin depresses the respiratory center so one stops breathing. And that ultimately leads to cardiac arrest. Nikki slipped into a coma. His heart stopped. Within minutes, he turned blue. He was dying. Steven Adler and Slash's girlfriend are dragging Nikki into the bathroom, turning on the faucet, the water, all the traditional stuff that you do to try and wake somebody up. Minutes went by, but nothing was working. Slash's girlfriend frantically started giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and yelled for someone to call 911. Within minutes, the ambulance was tearing down the Sunset Strip as it raced to the Franklin Hotel. But with no heartbeat and no respiration, Nikki's life is slipping away. The ambulance comes, they pronounce him dead at the scene. I was done. End of this story. Once again, Nikki was given up for dead. I don't want to die out here in the valley. As the ambulance raced towards Cedar sinai Hospital, fate took a strange turn. One of the paramedics, a Motley Crue fan, refused to give up on him. He ripped off Nikki's shirt and plunged in a needle. They give me two shots of adrenaline. That sort of just shocks the heart. And if anything's gonna get it started, that will. It did. Nikki's heart started beating again. I was dead two minutes. And they brought me back. You can't quit until you try. You can't live until you die. It's all about timing. If you get to the person right after the heart stopped, you could bring them back to life. Nikki Six had cheated death again, but the news had already hit the streets. By this point, Vince Neal's limo driver has already called Vince to tell him that Nikki Six has died. Doctors detoxed and stabilized Nikki. The next morning he came to. Still dazed and confused, he tore out all the needles and tubes and walked out wearing only his pants. I pulled the tubes out of my arms and 
escape because I'm insane at that point. I mean, isn't that what addicts do? He didn't realize that the whole world thought he was dead. The entire city of Los Angeles thinks Nikki Six is dead. And I went to the parking lot and there was two girls out there crying. And I knocked on their window and scared the hell out of them because it had already started to spread that I was dead. And I asked for a ride home. As they dropped him off, the girls made him promise he wouldn't do drugs again. And then he shoots up, he said, the biggest load of heroin he'd ever shot before in his life. I wanted to show how bad it can get. December 23rd, 1987. Motley Crue's Nikki Six had overdosed on heroin for a second time the night before. He was alive, thanks only to an EMT who was a Motley Crue fan and two shots of adrenaline. As doctors feverishly worked to keep him alive, word was spreading that the rock star had finally gone over the edge. Returning home, he changed the message on his answering machine. He did record a new voicemail, like saying, hi, this is Dickie. I'm sorry I can't come to the phone. I'm dead. Everybody gets high. Everybody gets low. He certainly looked dead. Nikki had lost over 40 pounds and wrote in his diary, the scabs on my arms are festering with infection. I can't breathe from all the blow and I can't seem to get drunk anymore. I'm at the edge. I feel like I'm standing at death's door and no one will let me in. No one knows better than an addict. I know the right dose, I know the right drug, I know the right way to handle my life. I know what the future looks like. It's all bullshit. I don't know any of that. I'm dying. But incredibly, within hours of returning from the hospital, he found another stash of heroin. You know when you're a junkie? When you can't not do junk. You're an addict when you can't not do it. And then he shoots up the biggest load of heroin he'd ever shot before in his life, passes out. Nikki had come a long way from his lonely childhood in small town Idaho. He'd lived on the streets of Hollywood, chasing a dream of rock and roll. It was a dream that had made him a millionaire, a dream that had taken him around the world and built a following of millions of rabid fans. But on Christmas morning of 1987, he woke up in his house alone, a needle still in his arm. Blood in the palm of my hand from running down my arm, from the needle just moving around and blood just trickling down my forearm. It was like, this has to end differently. And that was it. Nikki Six had finally bottomed out. I don't want to die. At some point, the, the mind sort of takes over, and you realize, you know, I'm going to be dead if I don't stop doing this. The bottoming out can occur actually at any phase. Somebody can get up the next morning, be shaking and uh, very anxious, and realize I got to do something about it now. But Nikki had tried to kick before. It was live or die at that point, and I just, I think, you know, I, I literally probably scared the hell out of me. For a guy who was heading straight towards the brick wall with his foot all the way down, somehow had the fear of God put in him. It wasn't like, Nikki's a bad boy, he got drunk last night. Nikki's a bad boy, did heroin last night. No, Nikki's a sick guy that is doing these things because he can't help himself. But his managers could. They canceled the upcoming European tour and gave Nikki an ultimatum. And we said, that's it. We're done with this. You guys, like, straighten up, clean up, and get out of here. It was all over. 
Nikki had moved from Heroin House into a place appropriately called Hidden Hills and quit cold turkey. Heroin's the hardest thing in the world to get off of. When you quit cold turkey, you go through a horrible withdrawal, vomiting, restlessness, insomnia. It's a horrible experience, and people liken it to feeling like they're going to die. The death kind of gave him a will to live again that he hadn't had before. I wake up in the morning and it comes back to you. For over a year, Nikki struggled to stay off drugs and adjust to life sober. It was harder than anything he could have imagined. During his addiction, heroin had taken over every single part of his reality. He started to discover life without being screwed up all the time. I mean, I remember Nikki saying to me, like, this is new. I didn't even know how to go to sleep. I knew how to pass out. You know, learning how to be social, learning how to be human, learning how to be non-rock godlike, that was work. Learning to live again was one thing. But after a year of brutal recovery, one big question remained. Would he still be able to rock? had been the toughest year of Nikki Six's entire life. He had quit heroin and spent a year in agonizing recovery. Now he was clean. But could a sober Nikki still be a rock star? Nikki soon found out. In September 1989, Dr. Feelgood was released. It was Motley Crue's best-selling album ever hitting number one on the Billboard chart and going platinum almost immediately. Nikki's Kickstart My Heart drew on first-hand experience. Kickstart My Heart is as adrenaline-soaked and as powerful and as gut-wrenching as anything that they had done. That's one of the greatest rock songs ever. The entire tour was done sober. The band is dangerous. The best I've ever heard the band was when everybody was firing on all cylinders. Way more dangerous than we were intoxicated. The band was brutal. And I think that, you know, that just shows, you know, how good it can get. I've been blessed to be able to survive an addiction, to be able to come through the other side of it. So Nikki decided to give something back. He established an arts and music program, Running Wild in the Night, for runaway kids at Covenant House, a homeless center in Los Angeles. Learning how to record music, learning how to play an instrument, learning how to paint, learning how to act. And it's been wonderful because it, it gives people just one more reason to stick. And if they stick long enough and they get it, the percentage of survival is so much higher. He is a role model for our kids. He's been there. And our youth look at him and say, if Nikki did it, I can do it too. But if people can look at me and say, wow, that guy can do it, and he had similar experiences to us, then, you know, that's, that's all I can ask for. Then, in 2003, Nikki rediscovered the diaries he kept while in the depths of his addiction. They says I had overdosed in London exactly a year earlier, Valentine's Day 1986. We had played Hammersmith Odeon, and the second we left the stage, I caught a taxi with Andy McCoy of Mahoney Rocks. We took, he took me to a heroin apartment in the real shabby neighborhood, and I was drunk. And I remember I was impressed that the dealer had clean needles, and he offered to shoot me up. I let him, big mistake. Well, just look at yourself, can you see where you are? I've kept diaries for a long time, but when I actually found those diaries after 20 years, I was like, you know, how did I get there? It, to me, was confirmation that I had dealt with a lot of the things that had driven me to addiction. 
It was a tough decision, but Nikki decided the diaries could help others avoid the trap he fell into. He was right. The resulting book, The Heroin Diaries, A Year in the Life of a Shattered Rock Star, became a New York Times bestseller, and it remained on the list for four months. It takes a lot of guts to put out a book like Heroin Diaries. I can't believe he went through what he went through. I never thought I'd see the day when Nikki would become the spokesperson for rehabilitation. And just like when he was a kid leaving Idaho, Nikki's found himself drawn back to his passion, music. With friends DJ Ashba and James Michael, Nikki formed a new band, 6 AM. Their first project was the Heroin Diary soundtrack. A single from the record, Life is Beautiful, popped at number two on the rock radio charts. He died and came back quite literally, and he chooses to continue to live, and I think people are inspired by that. I know Nikki's there for a lot of other artists who call him up and need, you know, somebody who understands what they're going through. He's a good dad, even outside his own family. Why would I not give back for someone who's received so much? The Heroin Diaries, the book, or the soundtrack, the new band 6AM, Motley Crue. I, mean, I have everything that I ever wanted. It's like a fairy tale. Just open your eyes, just open your eyes and see that life is beautiful. Tomorrow on Talking Meadow. Do you remember hearing Metallica for the first oh. time? I'll never forget that. It just sounded intense. I was always down for any of the bands that were actually genuine. Talking Metal premieres tomorrow at 12 a.m. Eastern, 9 Pacific. Part of the all-new Fuse. Warm up your vocals for an all-new 10 Great Reasons. Pop Princesses. Who's going to take over the throne? Who's going to pass the scrunchie from Madonna? 10 Great Reasons. New episode Tuesday at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on the all-new Fuse.